we have a list of uh, pneumococcal vaccine eligible conditions. And you're looking at the greedy data in our, based upon our study. The epidemiologists report we so-called population attributable risk of percent. What that means is, is basically is a simple measures for how much of a risk factor is a contributing to the outcome disease of interest. So in this case, the risk factor would be asthma, and outcome disease of interest is invasive pneumococcal disease. So then we measure PAR percent. So then if you look at it, in, in this particular our study, in the PAR percent of asthma is about 17%, which meaning 17% of the burden of invasive pneumococcal disease is it can be attributable to asthma. What about other dozens of all pneumococcal vaccine eligible conditions? About 25%. So 25% of dozens high risk conditions actually contribute to the burden of invasive pneumococcal disease, only 25%, as opposed to 70% asthma alone. This is, I believe, is a very significant findings, given that a large proportion of, I mean, the population do have an asthma, in not only in the United States, especially in developed country. So this is a pretty big deal in terms of a public health standpoint. In terms of implications on research, I can see you know, immediately two areas here. The first one is this. Certainly, we need to find out why is the case. Why, why asthmatic patients indeed have increased risk of or increased susceptibility to this invasive pneumococcal disease. And so the mechanistic standpoint, we still certainly need to find the mechanism underlying increase or increased risk or susceptibility to microbial infections. But the second point is this one too, though. This is a very interesting part. And it's a simple question whether the association between asthma and invasive pneumococcal disease we found in this study is going to be the true for other bacterial infections and as well. There are a bunch of other infections out there, and even just vaccine uh, preventable diseases, such as when one example is a pertussis. We had a major outbreak in Olmsted County in, uh, a few years ago. So then whether an asthma contribute to you know this the burden of other bacterial infections such as in a pertussis this is going to be uh, i believe is a very important part uh, of an implications and i i think i believe in our studies actually that kind of uh, contribute to we, we are in a very exciting moment right now and uh, we are very excited and uh, probably we're going to looking at uh, three uh, main areas well uh, first one is this so we try to look at uh, certainly why is the case as many patients have increased, increased susceptibility to microbial infections. What would be the a mechanism underlying that uh, susceptibility? That's uh, one of the areas we try to look at it. The second one is going to be we, we try to look at whether this is going to be the case for other bacterial infections or not. That's going to be certainly one, one area. We already kind of found it, you know, several uh, infectious diseases, uh, for example, in pertussis, example. And is, is we already reported this year in uh, PDAT Academic Society meetings, we found that asthmatic patients indeed have increased risk of acquiring pertussis when they're exposed to equally between asthmatics and non-asthmatics. So we tr try to look at whether this is going to be the case for some other infectious disease or, you know, or microbial infections caused by some uh, other organism. That's one area. But also we try to extending uh, our study to non-infectious chronic disease, such as, uh, because this is going to be an interesting part, and we are very excited to look at it. So whether this association between infectious disease and asthma is going to be case for other non-infectious uh, chronic diseases, such as inflammatory bowel disease, and rheumatoid arthritis, and even coronary artery disease, even the cancers. For example, certain cancers are such as cervical cancer. The third area is an important part, actually. Uh, even if asthmatic patients have increased risk of developing invasive pneumococcal disease or other infections and this and that, but I personally do not believe all asthmatic patients behave that way. So there's a certain subgroup of asthmatic patients is actually do have increased susceptibility to infections, do have immune incompetence. I don't believe all of them. So therefore, this is a very important area to somehow to identify, identify those individuals, those subgroup of asthmatic patients who have increased susceptibility to infections and also immune incompetence so that uh, they are just different from other 
asthmatic patient and certainly non-asthmatic patients. So then I think it, it, to me, this becoming, uh, if we, our hypothesis and our conceptual framework is uh, correct, then this is becoming very important phenotypic characteristics of a certain asthmatic patient, which had never been discovered before. So that's one thing. And then uh, to do that, we try to kind of profile to identify or to characterize those individuals based upon immunology parameters and some clinical parameters. That's a kind of our you know, third area. But certainly, you know, fourth area is going to be once we identified, we were able to somehow the profile or identified those subgroup asthmatic patients who have different immune capacity or immune incompetence, then we try to somehow come up with a treatment plans or interventions such as immunomodulatory approach to enhancing their immune responses to either microbial antigens or even vaccines.